So I'd like to share my course of the paper. It is called Beyond Smoothing, Unsupervised Graph Representation Learning uh, with uh, Asian Hydrophilic Hydrophilic discriminating. So this is a joint, this is a joint work with my co-supervised student, PhD student Yi Xin Liu, and co-supervised by Shi Rui Pan and uh, Vincent Lee. So uh, this topic is about uh, graph neural networks. So graph convolutional networks uh, are considered as the most powerful neural network architecture for handling graph structure data. So it uh, uses uh, the uh, feature, uh, feature smoothing. It is also called neighborhood aggregation or message passing to construct node representations. For it is generally naively to aggregate the features of neighbors to re reinforce the central node representations. So however, the success of the graph convolution networks relies on the homophily assumption. So it, it, they assume that uh, the two nodes connected by an uh, edge should be have similar features, similar representations. However, in the real world, uh, two nodes might uh, connected, uh, uh, connected nodes might have very different uh, representations. We call the edges connected the very different uh, uh, nodes uh, called uh, Heterophilic edges. So we use uh, edge disc discriminator to uh, discriminate the uh, homophily edges and the heterophilic edges. And we construct representations on the two edge views. And we design a, a pivot angular loss to train the edge discriminator. It is tried to uh, force the uh, nodes connected by heterophilic edges have a, a lower lower similarity than the node pairs, uh, random sampling node pairs, and force the uh, node pairs connected by the uh, homophily edges to have a high similarity than the nodes uh, than the random sampling uh, sampled node pairs. So, for more information about this work, please come to talk to me in the post session. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Marcus, and I will very briefly outline to you something that I've been working on for a little over 10 years now. Um, let me start with a bit of history. So about 200 years ago, Charles Darwin explored the world on the HMS Beagle. And upon returning home, he noticed that some of the specimens of finches that he collected at the Galapagos Islands, they varied in terms of their beaks and their plumage. Um, to me, that's quite an astounding discovery because uh, it shows that there are problems in the real world where you can have structurally very different solutions. But all the birds survived, right? They all had to face the same problem. They solved the problem of surviving on a remote island. And there were very different solutions to this. In IT, diverse sets of solutions can also be very useful. I'll very briefly outline two situations. First one, let's assume an earthquake, I guess, uh, takes out part of our uh, power system, a uh, power grid, and now it may be up to us to devise a restoration plan. Now, ideally, that's not only just a single restoration plan that does its job and restores everything, but maybe we want to create a set of, uh, a diverse set of solutions that are all great in terms of resources that they consume, um, but they maybe turn on things in different orders. Then. Uh, but with these different plans, a, a human uh, expert can go ahead and pick the one that they actually want to implement. At an algorithmic level, very loosely rated is the idea or is the situation inspirational image generation where a, uh, a user already comes to you with a solution and says, I would like to have solutions that are kind of similar in quality but different in a high dimensional, complex, non trivial feature space. So these are two situations where I think diversity can be quite helpful. If you'd like to learn more about how diversity can be helpful in um, algorithm understanding, algorithm tuning, algorithm portfolios, please come to me to the poster. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, so I'm going to present this uh, paper, which is majorly done by my PhD student in collaboration with um, SMU and University of Melbourne. Um, so it's about, so already talked about graph representation learning. So this is about finding anomalies in graph, like for example, citation network and finding uh, like an unusual author um, there. Uh, and uh, specifically looking in, so graph anomaly detection and the uh, uh, challenge in there is that there's high, because we don't have uh, uh, knowledge about label, uh, label of uh, like anomalies, um, there is this uh, high, uh, it has high uh, false positive rate 
great. So one um, approach uh, to look into it is to uh, use uh, cross-domain. So use a uh, given and unlabeled uh, target uh, graph. Uh, you want to get like use an uh, uh, like a source uh, graph that is labeled uh, to identify anomalies. Um, so there are uh, two challenges here uh, for cross-domain uh, graph anomaly detection. One is that there is a, a substantial discrepancies in graph structures, and the other is uh, that different distributions of anomalies uh, are like there are different distribution anomalies in uh, different data sets or even in one data set. Uh, so in this paper, we uh, found uh, like we proposed a new domain adaptation technique. Uh, uh, which, uh, for example, in this uh, uh, plot, you can see on an A that there is this discrepancy between the source and uh, uh, source anomaly and uh, source anomaly and target anomaly and also the normals uh, on A. Uh, but then our proposed method, you can see that there is a good, perfect, like very, very good alignment uh, between these two domains. So uh, it actually aligns the uh, normal class in uh, in source and uh, target, as well as uh, using control interesting learning um, uh, uh, using graph uh, structure. Uh, we have good results as well, so come to the poster. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm a first year PhD student from Nash Medical AI Group. And today, I'm happy to introduce our recent work towards transverse skin cancer diagnosis where we're writing models decision. In this work, we aim to address the embarrassing issue in skin cancer diagnosis caused by domcospic artifacts. And to achieve this, we propose an explainable and interactive system consisting of three steps. Firstly, we cluster the model's behavior to identify the <coughs> confounding concepts such as rulers, dark corners. And we also collect clinical concepts from existing probing data sites. And then we construct a concept bank by learning a set of concept activation writers. And finally, the concept bank is mapped to the bottleneck layer of the model, and we use a logical layer for reasoning. Beneficial from the logical layer, we can observe the decision process of the model and intervene by modifying the logical truth table. And we perform experiments on five highly biased sets and uh, explore the impact of removing each component concept through human interaction. Uh, it can be seen that all method using human interaction can significantly improve the performance across five, five data sets. For more details, please refer to our CPR paper. Thank you. Uh, OK. Hi, everyone. My name is Xuan Lingzhao. I'm a PhD student of Zhongyuan Ge. So today I'm going to talk about the work uh, learning network architecture for open site recognition. So the main task here is the open site recognition. So normally a, for deep, in deep learning, so like a, a classification model, it will like have the closed set assumption where like the, at the training time and the test time, the classes are the same. So, how, so for example, like if a model is only trained to classify cats and dogs, so they will have like two classes. However, in test time, in reality, sometimes there may be some unknown classes. So this is what the open set recognition trying to solve. So here we can see that for a class set class classifier, so the boundaries you just need to separate the uh, different known classes. While for open set classifier, the boundaries need to so everything that's outside the Boundaries of a known class is belong to unknown classes, and so the previous works um, focus on using like existing works, uh, existing architectures such as the VGG or ResNet. However, since they are designed based on the closed set assumption, so there's no guarantee that it will also work for the open set recognition. So that's why we use the network architecture search to automate the process of finding an architecture. So. Uh, for network architecture search, and one example is shown in the, on the right. So we build a supernet connecting all of the cells, and then we, uh, at the end, after the searching, we choose some of the cells. So uh, and also to ensure that our model works for open site recognition, we use the VAE contrastive learning to make sure it reduces the open space risk, and we also use the pseudo auxiliary searching where we treat part of the known classes as unknown classes during the searching phase. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So